What's up, man? Can you see me? I can. Uh, there you are. Yeah. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Did you do a Murph today? <laughs> Not yet. That's that's my afternoon. Okay, I'm doing one uh, on Wednesday morning. Yeah, I did one. Uh, I did one. What was it? Uh, Saturday. And yeah, my uh, my tendons aren't aren't liking me right now. <laughs> oh, man, are your elbows hurting at all? Yeah, exactly. That's that's where it hurts is those elbows. Yeah. Uh, but hey, it's good. You know. Yeah. It's good you're staying so active. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading your post the other day and just like starting to see people engage in that group. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. There, um, if I can get my Colorado friends and other people involved, uh, then I, I think it's interesting to sort of mix the groups together, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure, I do. Um, well, man, let's go ahead. Uh, so we're going to break down some jiu-jitsu matches. Uh, yeah. Maybe this will go well. I mean, I saw Mike do this the other day, and I was like, we should do this. We had planned a podcast. Uh, I appreciate you coming back on. But it, sure. yeah, I've been trying to just do a bunch of jiu-jitsu content right now. Uh, yeah. I got a jiu-jitsu guy on every day this week. Check out some episodes. Uh, Omar French is tomorrow. Nice. Uh, Eric Ingram will be on next week. Clay, Clay Mayfield's coming on this week. Um, Daniel O'Brien. Nice. On Thursday. Alan Shade uh, is coming on Wednesday. Uh, and I got a bunch more lined out. Uh, Mitch is coming on Friday at noon, his time. Yeah, good. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Man, I've just been um, – following his uh facebook post and they are hilarious oh but, he's he's the he's one of the funniest guys that i've ever met i mean he's yeah he is hilarious he'll be entertaining i i think yeah. i mean he'll be informative too you guys will have good history stuff to talk about but he's all just he's also just really funny yeah well you know he just had a an article uh that was published i believe in the washington post well, commenting post. yeah so that'll be some good uh, that'll be some good stuff for us to chat about. And um, man, I've listened to him on several podcasts since you turned me on to him. So it'd be cool to to sit down and talk with him. Yeah, yeah, he's 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 just a good guy, really smart and knows what he's doing. And uh, he's got an interesting like you know I don't know if you you guys will get into uh, his personal life or anything like that, but. Um, He's also got, you know, he's got an interesting uh, home life. He's got uh, diabetic kids, and so they've lived with that for a long time. And, uh, so it, it's, you know, uh, he is, I have so much respect for him, uh, not just as a historian and, and as a friend, but just as a person who's uh, sort of, you know, pleasantly struggled through adversity for a long time. So. Man, we have a couple of parents at the gym that I get to see their commentary on how different it is to raise their kid with diabetes. And then those yeah. kids will be the students in the class. And oftentimes they're a sibling also. Um, and, and there's, in one case, there's four kids without that, or three kids without diabetes and one kid with diabetes, you know? Yeah. So it's, right, right. Yeah. No, I need, he, yeah, he's got, a, he's, he's got that kind of, situation so anyway yeah it'll be a good interview he's a good dude i'm excited about it man um okay so let's figure out this screen share uh i haven't personally done uh done this with a youtube video but uh i assume that it's not gonna be an issue uh let me find my playlist here okay which match did you want to break down first was um Either one, uh, we can do uh, we can do Geo and Eddie. Okay. If you want to do that first, since it's it's a little more mix of styles. Okay. Share screen. Oh, 
Okay. Yeah. Can you see cool. that? Yeah. Right. yeah. We did it. <laughs> okay, so um, do, when did this match take place with? Let me uh, take place on Donaher with his uh, rash guard on. Yeah, I think it's 2017. I mean, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, have you kept up with Eddie Cummings at all recently? No, I haven't seen a whole lot. I, I look for content on him just because, you know, he, he was in terms of like the Danaher crew, he was sort of my entry into that. You, I believe you told me about Eddie Cummings, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and uh, so, but, you know, he broke with those guys and, um, you know, I think he's still training. I just haven't seen a whole lot on him. Yeah, a lot of people speculate that Eddie Cummings is the was was the uh, sort of inspiration or brain brainchild behind a lot of the leg lock systems to come out of the Henzo Gracie Academy. I don't know if that's true or not. I've just heard people speculate. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I think he was he was probably the the first one to be as successful as he was I, i'm not sure he and gary tonin were were so close in time uh when they were first sort of making the scene that uh, it's hard to tell and have you um did the marcello uh butterfly stuff come out on bjj fanatics yet do you know uh i don't know i haven't seen that yet I saw him promoting it, and then I saw him promoting some, like, North-South series he has coming out. And, uh, man, I'm going to buy that Butterfly series, but I haven't, like, I keep meaning to check um, yeah. to see if it's available. But uh, Eddie there is doing some of that more solo style sitting. Uh, oh, well. yeah. Well, maybe we should stop it and talk for a second. <laughs> yeah. Anytime, anytime you want me to pause. Yeah. Well, we, we were, yeah, <laughs> we were talking about other stuff. I wasn't. Um, so I, I guess the first thing that, uh, I know, you know, Eddie Cummings and all the Danaher guys are going to pretty much do the same thing from the beginning, right? They're looking for a two on one, looking for, uh, you know, an arm and a collar tie. And they're looking for, uh, you know, inside leg position. It's all about inside leg position for them. You know, and so I'm sure Gio knows that and he's willing to play on his knees, but he, he's doing that like. Uh, he inverts here in a set. Well, yeah, and he's trying, look when he inverts, he crosses his legs. And. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, if I was thinking about it, I think that's kind of a counter, the inversion and the cross leg is a counter to Eddie playing all inside leg position. You know, yeah, that's interesting. And then we do a little, I've been teaching that Granby drill um, just because we've been studying those 10 point of warm ups. But like when I show A1, I'll have somebody sit on their knees and yeah. somebody cross their feet like that and invert with yeah. the Granby. That's interesting. That does throw up some defense to attacks as well. Yeah, he can also, from that cross footed position, if he gets it around, if he crosses his feet over one of Eddie's legs, then he can unravel himself into uh, an inside leg position in his own ashigurami or uh, even a honey hole. Yeah. So I know that's something that they, they work on at, at, at 10th Planet. Um, so let's stop there for a sec. Okay. So if you put them back to that just a little bit because this is where eddie gets his entry do we want to um i can probably slow down the playback speed on this too i should be able to yeah see how he look his bottom leg isn't in yet like so he doesn't he's he's got his top leg over but his bottom leg it's coming like under Gio's knee, right? It's behind Gio's knee. And then if I think if you saw the other side, Eddie's probably got Gio's right arm or he's fishing for his right arm mm -hmm. to kind of keep him down. And then look, he's pushing that knee up under to try to lock it down. 
and then he'll roll into the honey hole right there. Nice. Yeah. It's pretty, <laughs> pretty elegant. And then here's what Geo does almost for like the rest of the match is he does this thing. Look at his defense. He's hugging his own leg. That's, I've heard Ted Planet talk about that a lot. Yeah. Interesting. And he'll keep, and so, you know, Eddie's forced to like keep trying to pull his arms off. He'll go for that primary leg and then he'll switch to like the secondary leg. Uh, but he, you know, he's, he keeps trying to fish, right? He's trying to get up under there. Um, and, uh, Gio just stays close and, you know, has locked down his own leg, <laughs> basically. It takes a lot of flexibility too. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's a, that sort of lateral flexibility in your knees is like I have that on my right leg that lateral cartilage gets iffy if I start trying to do too much on it but it's um I'm always impressed people joke that you when your meniscus tears everything gets better <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah right there's nothing holding it in place anymore <laughs> yeah but man he, he's just he's hugging the crap out of it and Eddie's just that, trying to that's super interesting yeah yeah and that's his own foot he's hugging, right? Yeah, yeah, it's his own foot. And Eddie's got under his arm, and he's just trying to peel his hands away. And mm -hmm. Gio will let him and then go, go back with his other arm and just keep switching. A lot of hand fighting. Yeah. Geo did some, uh, like at the beginning, Geo did some stuff that's from the uh, warm-ups. Yeah, yeah. So like that dive over, he did the, uh, he did the B2 sort of rolling Kimura thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, didn't work, but. <laughs> what, uh, what has some of the big takeaways been for you on the uh, – we're through the E series so far, uh, so five of eight yeah. on the 10th Planet warm-ups. I'm doing tons of different stuff when I roll. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it has changed some pathways for me for sure. Yeah, and I think that's probably the biggest thing is, is pathways. Um, they're just – because you repeat them so much and because they're, you know uh, – that is super interesting. He has, yeah. his, he has like a 50 50. Yeah. Eddie has his arm or leg in a straight ankle position, but he's hugging his, uh, his foot in from the leg triangle, though. That's super interesting. Well, Eddie's actually in the honey hole. So his right knee is over the top of yeah, yeah. It, uh, Gio's thigh. And Gio's just basically, he, he, put himself in a figure four and then he's pulling his foot that's in the honey hole position, just straight into his chest and just locking it down. So he's just, he's like this. <laughs> I don't know if you could see that. Yeah. No, that's, inter that's an interesting position. There's that funny meme going around about quarantine and like somebody heel hooking themselves like a stretch <laughs> like that. And it, uh, somebody right. tagged, tagged Jason Ryan in it and was like, Jason Ryan, week four quarantine or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you got to be your own uke. So, so, but Gio has an outside entanglement other than his foot getting dragged across, right? But it's Eddie that's in the honey hole. Correct? Yeah, right. And so, Eddie's now... Uh, working on that that other leg Ooh. and yeah he's he's trying to um, now that he's got it released you know it, it's it's separated from him a little bit so he's trying to pull it out so that he can do that inside heel hook but Gio just keeps re-grabbing 
and yeah. pulling on Eddie's hands. Um, and notice he, you know, uh, Gio stays close. He never, he's not going backwards. He's, he's just, in, he's sitting there embracing it, you know? So he never gets in that in-between position yeah. where he's, you know, not far enough or not close enough to defend. So he just stays close, man. Just stays really close. Just fights for his own foot. Yeah, I like how like how he's leaning forward like that. Like that's such a subtle distribution of your weight that Yeah. Like from the sitting butterfly, he was doing that earlier. That's why I commented on sort of the Marcelo because that's how you avoid getting pushed over. And like you're yeah. saying on the leg attack game, it's how you avoid uh, your leg getting elongated out to that nice little sleep spot where you get heel hooked. Yeah, and look what it does to Eddie's, like, right leg. It's actually putting a lot of pressure on his right leg. Yeah. It's almost like pressure passing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was watching a match with uh, – uh, Somebody, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was it was it was a recent uh, ADCC, but uh, it was against the leg locker, and that that was sort of it looked like their strategy was it's pressure passing. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, who who was it? Um, was it Lepre that beat uh, Gordon Ryan twice? Hmm. To beat Gordon Ryan twice on points. Yeah, I can't remember. Hold on, I feel feel stupid. I can't remember that. Uh, but uh, that was kind of the bag on those matches. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, and he keeps, you know, they roll around, and I think he's in a better position, sort of on top here. You know. Cummings can still roll through and invert if he wants to, but um, I think it's easier for Gio to be sitting up and, and going down on his own leg. Yeah, Eddie finally got sick of it, released it, goes There's to his back. Uh, back take, yeah. Yeah, it was a nice transition. And then he's going for the Locking that arm down like Marcelo. <laughs> He's almost got a crucifix there. Felipe Pena is who I was thinking about. Okay. Yeah. And he's going to go for this triangle. Break moment. those down because, wow, this is getting exciting. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of the bag is the pressure passing. We'll try yeah. the triangle arm bar uh, option here. Maybe switch to reverse triangle. Just yesterday, man, I was rolling um, and was in like a 50-50, but switched it to a back take and thought about you. The first person I saw do that. <laughs> look, at Gio's just holding on for dear life right here. Yeah. But look at his defense. He's crossed his arms as a defense to that, uh, to that reverse triangle. Yeah because it keeps that left arm down, and that's it. It goes to overtime. Okay. Keeps that left arm down, right? Because if it pops up, uh, he's done. But, man, he, 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 he played defense the whole time, right? Because Eddie had the honey hole and was just putting it on him um, and looking for some kind of submission. So he just, you know, Gio just held on. Finally got into that triangle, that reverse triangle position, and just held on there. Man, I really do like the overtime rounds for. Oh, I do too. Yeah, I do too. Have you been doing that any during uh, noontime rolling, working those rounds in or anything? Um. No, we, uh, you know, we will do stuff from position sometimes, you know. Um, I think recently uh, what we've been doing is, like, if there's some element of the 10th Planet warm-ups that we want to emphasize or, or play with, because, uh, you know, they, all of them, like, if you're doing the pressure passes or you're doing the standing passes, things like that, 
um, you know, that they assume that you can get by somebody. So we like, all right, let's actually see what this is like <laughs> if you're going to have to use this pressure pass and what are people, how are people defending and things like that. Yeah. Because it, it's the only issue that I have with the 10th Planet warmups is that they're just so linear. That, that's what I was, I was uh, talking with Brent yesterday, and I was like, well, man, it's just a method. It's a, it's yes. a, linear, uh, how, exactly, it's a linear forward progression. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got great, it's very useful because of that, but it also has its, you know, has its problems because of that. Well, and it's like, I, that's why I'm like, well, ultimately, the, the, is, I think more methods we can incorporate, like, hey, we did the warm-ups. Maybe we did some sort of little solo drill. Um, then we're doing core technique. Now we're doing some situational or free rolling where you're just, man, you're getting as many methods as you can for class. And that's, that is like, a, like a pro of like, well, what now we can probably ensure that we're going to have a chain drill once yeah. per class. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 No. And it's, it's also, God, man, in jujitsu, I think it's really important just to do something new every once in a while. Just yeah. train differently. Just change your style. Uh, just because there's so many out there. And, it, you know, if you're going to be really knowledgeable and proficient about how the, the, the sport's evolving, I think you just got to do that. Well, and that's, that was kind of what led us to doing these um... – matches other than just jones and for some jujitsu is uh like hey let's compare these yeah. styles Style. like uh dds 10p and, and what's coming out of australia yeah so uh geo right here he's basically doing the c3 arm crush to arm bar routine he just keeps going back and forth on it yeah i mean it, it's it's pretty classic 10th planet <laughs> sort of position yeah. You know who taught a bunch of cool spiderweb stuff that he said he learned from Eddie Bravo uh, was George Soteropoulos. Oh, yeah? When I, yeah, I got trained with him when he came to Inferno. He's coming on Caleb's podcast. I saw that. I saw Caleb advertise for that. That's, that's cool. Eddie finally gets on top right there. He get Almost gets oh, stretched wow. out. Oh, he's he's... Back in. Did he tap? And then, yeah, and then he tapped. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. But it, it took him a long time. Remember, he's got a chance. Yeah, he's got a chance to do it faster. Yeah. Um, back mount, it looks like. Yeah. Man, imagine making that, that sort of coin toss decision. Um, hey, you just got submitted and the whole match depends on this. Would you like the back or the arm bar? <laughs> I don't I, I don't I think I'd have to take the back, man. I I can't imagine not doing that. But I know, right? It's yeah. it's interesting too that you get a choice. Yeah, well, and maybe we're I was thinking about that. Maybe our training style or what we've emphasized in in uh, in our systems in, in in Arkansas that you know that positional hierarchy is so important, and the back is just a you know it just seems like a clearly better position than that spiderweb. But agree. Man. Have you had a chance to watch any of the? Um the twister uh, mastering the twister stuff yet uh no i have i mean I've... in the beginning of it like in the first few minutes eddie goes over kind of their sort of i guess you could say their positional hierarchy yeah and he goes over like the arm bar or spider web to back take and this like and then the truck and he does the interplay between all three of them and he he explains it's like a broader like this goes to everything everything comes to this oh, but yeah. like those three situations truck um spider web and back take he, they they really link all of those together intricately and he, he kind of has a little tangent where he goes on that it's interesting because you see how much that's defined a lot of their system yeah 
for sure. For sure, yeah. It, yeah, you could almost see it. Uh, you know, I think Eddie was doing that twister like at Bluebell, right? Yeah. And it was a, I think it was like a catch wrestling technique or some, something like that. Oh, we got out. Yeah. Uh, and the other stuff just kind of evolved from that, you know, they just discovering new positions off of it and, and kind of going from there. Oh, what a, what a cool moment. Yeah. Well, and he was, he was playing defense the whole match. And then, you know, he struggles to finally get a submission on that arm bar. And then, uh, you know, that, that escape, it, it, you know, it just, that was a, that was a gutsy match by him. He had to, he had to dig deep for that. Yeah, man, that was a good match. Um, yeah, you know what I liked about both of those guys though? They're using both using Marcelo Garcia techniques. <laughs> like you know, I mean, I wonder how much Eddie tra if he cross trained with Marcelo being right there. Well, if you're in New York, you can't help but do that. You know, I mean, that stuff's hugely influential, and in how how Marcelo um does those back techniques how marcelo does like their entry like danaher's systems entry off of the the butterfly and the two-on-one mm -hmm. stuff i mean that's classic marcelo garcia stuff agreed hey I, there's one i i added i told you i created a little playlist of maybe some future things we could watch or that i want to watch whether i do this with you or whoever but I found this just looking at some of uh, Eddie Cummins, but there's an Eddie Cummins versus Nathan Orchard here I haven't seen that's like four yeah. minutes long. You want to watch it? Sure, yeah. All right, let's check it out. And then we'll hop on to that uh, Gordon Ryan. But I thought that'd be another good stylistic. It gives us another Eddie Cummins and then uh, another 10th planet to look at. Yeah, yeah. And if I remember this one, I, I, I've seen this one before. Uh, I think – Eddie gets him, uh, but you can see. Look, inside leg technique, <laughs> messing yeah. with the, the hand, the collar tie. You know, it's you know what it, that's the scary part. You know what Eddie Cummings is doing. You know exactly what he's going to do, and he still does it to you. Man, it's I love you know one thing I've grown to really like about Tim's Planet stuff is that. How much Eddie Bravo pays homage to the people that inspired him? Oh, for sure. Like Marcelo and others. But, like, I remember oh, yeah. before I even knew who Goker Shevichin was, I'm like, why is this technique called the go-car? <laughs> and and <laughs> now I'm like, oh, that's who he learned it from. Like the D'Souza Pass and stuff like that. I like Yeah, yeah. even his own students. You know, if they come up with something that's interesting to him, he'll name the technique after. The Dead Orchard. Yeah. Would be one. Um, yep. yep. And that's that's him right there. That's Nathan Orchard, right? Yeah, I believe so. I believe that's the, the guy that 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 uh that got kind of made made that technique famous and they named it after him, if I'm not yep. mistaken. Yeah. But look at Eddie getting that outside of that elbow and just playing him across. Yeah. He almost got his back. These That's are they're no playing problem. on an interesting angle here. Oh wow. Yeah. I hear that Eddie Cummings grips are just ridiculous too. I wonder how much he works in the gi. I, I think not at all. I don't think he does any. Wow. I mean I don't I don't know that for sure, but I've never seen him in a gi. I haven't either, man. That's why I kinda I was wondering, is he? Uh, uh, but is he a black belt? I assume so. Yeah, that's I, what I was thinking. But yeah, I've only ever seen him do nogi stuff. Yeah. See, he's tr he's trying to get that bottom foot, keep that inside position on the on the side that, and he he does that. Uh, he'll do that shin to shin right there. Yeah, that keeps coming up. Yeah. But it, it's like at an angle. Like they get at this. I don't know if it's because the orchards that like he kind of like turns. Like, yeah. yeah that was. 
<clears throat> and that's something that the Aussies do is that shin on shin thing. See, look at that. I mean, he's got him in, <laughs> he's got him completely on his side in his guard <laughs> and just keeps playing that, that underneath. Eventually Nathan will get up. Yeah. But you can see, like, Cummings on, is on the offensive all the time. Oh, wow. Nice transition. Yeah. Rolls into it. This is where I thought Nathan might have a chance. Like, if he could cross over that right leg, over Eddie's yeah. right yeah. leg, yeah. right there, then he could get that kind of electric chair position. But Eddie wasn't having any of it. He goes down on that foot, which he pulls out and – yeah, now he's got that outside position and fishing for the heel. Ouch. How would you right. like that guy to be on you like that? Like oh, in a I'd match? Be, I, I would be so panicky at that point. <laughs> you know? And and you train for that. Like I I remember uh you were asking Jack the other day about uh the latest thing that he was doing with Hickson and basically they were doing panic training right yeah. it's like okay how do you stay underneath and just take the pressure be comfortable <laughs> and and kind of find your moment man we were doing we were in the gym the other day just like filming some videos and stuff and uh and doing a little rolling but it had come up that uh like i've been telling everybody like i'll mount them and i'll i'll put my, my hand on their throat like this and they always grab for it. And then right. I get wrap them or rear mount them. Right. So, right. Um, but then someone was like, well, what do I do? You know, I was like, well, you just bridge and roll. And then they're like, well, it's not that easy. But then they did it to me like a few minutes later in a live roll. And I just, yeah, right. The Hicks and bridge. I didn't even have to touch their hands. Yeah. <laughs> but because it was, it's, they're so down. Okay, so here we got Jordan ver uh, or sorry, Gordon versus uh, Gregory Jones. Yeah, and Craig's, you know, he's doing the same thing to Gordon that Gordon's trying to do to him. You know, he, they're, Greg's just fishing for inside leg position and, uh, you know, looking for, for heel hook entries. Well, th this has EDI over time as well, does it not? Yes, it does. It does. This has one of the most interesting armbar transitions in it. I'll be excited. Uh, I think that's in the overtime. But this is, I think, like when people really started to uh, start referring to the K guard. Uh huh. Like it's uh, it's kind of this unique little armbar transition where your legs are are not triangled like triangle armbar like towards their face, but towards yeah. your legs. Yeah. Hey, stop it for a sec. Yeah. See yeah. that? Yeah. See that little kind of reverse De La Hiva yes. thing? You know, they're looking for that a lot. And like, if you look at Lachlan Giles sort of thing, mm -hmm. he'll do that, but then he'll transition that shin to go over the, the front and then he'll, he'll spin under. But stay, but stay on the same ankle. Yeah, yeah. Man, were you at the Black Belt Conference not this past year, but the one before when Justin Raider was talking about passing reverse De La Hiba like that? Yeah, well, I remember you guys showing the techniques. It's, it was interesting how he was – just kind of going in the subtlety of the angle of like how he would like – position and what he would do to their other foot when being reverse De La Hiba is real yeah. I felt like sports specific and I don't use a lot of reverse De La Hiba but like I mean people whose guard I try to pass sometimes do yeah yeah and I get it's for these Ashigurami sort of based things I think it's really useful I mean it, you know it, it just takes a little getting used to because part of its inversion 
and so you gotta <laughs> you gotta think of it <laughs> upside down going in <laughs> So it's a, it's a little bit hard to teach and it's a little bit hard to think about, but I, I, I can see the applicability for these guys. And look, I think Greg Jones is the one who's pushing on all this stuff. I mean, he's the one who's more active and going for legs. The first time I saw this match, um, it, 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 I was like, man, this dude is, is legit. You know, it was, I remember him being on my radar from sort of this match forward. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And they'll start on that one leg and then they'll transition to the other leg. That's the Aussies do that a lot. Hold on, I'm going to pause this. R Randy Melton just texts me and says, we have to wear a face cover with us at all times and wear it if we'll be three foot or from someone for longer than 15 minutes. <laughs> I look like I'm wearing a cravat. <laughs> Randy. Oh, man. Man. Randy, <laughs> man, uh, he takes me about every day because... Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> oh, man. Well, shout out to you, Randy. I'm sure he's going to watch our episode. He's been enjoying all the podcasts that have been coming out. Good, man. Yeah. I, uh, Randy and I text back and forth almost every day. He's always sending me stuff, which I love. See, man, he gets up about the same time of day as me. Um, I slept in a little bit till like 5.30 this morning, but usually I've still been getting up at 4 and just yeah. like doing stuff. Like, uh, but I've got to bed. I'm in a habit of going to bed, man. I can't stay up past 10 most nights. Yeah. Look, there's, there's Gordon doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. that, sh that shin across, right? Single leg. Oh, and nice. then And then Greg just sits on it, which was, you know, great. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's vulnerable if he's up. <clears throat> What's interesting is to see that against a Barambolo guy who likes to sit and then he'll try to roll out of it. So, like, uh, there's a new one from ADCC this year, which I think was uh, – Paulo Miao and uh, yeah, 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 and Nikki Ryan, and that was that was interesting because Nikki was you know he was real hesitant about that sort of Barambolo off of the leg techniques. He got into that entanglement nicely. There it is. A lot of leg pummeling. Oh yeah, wow. slid out. Yeah, but Gordon's just yeah he he releases his knee line so quickly, you know because you got to have. You know, you got to have inside leg position, but then you got to establish that lock on the knee line. And that's where Gordon just won't have any of it. You know, even when Greg gets inside leg position, Gordon will just pull out. I'm surprised that, that and maybe he wasn't there yet, but I'm surprised Gordon Ryan wasn't trying his sort of pressure passing. Ooh. <laughs> that's what i do when sharpie tries to do that over me <laughs> every time we roll <laughs> i know he does it to me too oh man <laughs> did you I watch love the, uh, combat jiu-jitsu fights the other night with like jams and eddie fivey no nah, i didn't see it it was good jams won with the heel hook nice but um there was but uh um Oh, um, not Sakuraba, but uh, Imanari. Imanari was on there and had some amazing fights. Yeah. It was exciting. I, I really enjoyed watching them. Yeah, yeah. well, and that – you have fight pass? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay good, good. Because I'm going to say you're welcome to, um, you know, my stuff. But uh, they're all on fight pass. Yeah. You got to uh... – if you think about it, like a lot of the – Imanari goes way back, and he's one of those influential guys too. Yeah. You know, all the inversion techniques, all that stuff that 10th Planet does. You know, that you got to give Imanari a ton of credit for that stuff too. Man, have you had a chance – I think I've texted you freaking out about it two times now. I like this overhead. But have you had a chance to check out that variation of C2 on the BJJ Fanatics 10th Planet warm-ups we have? Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated. 
<laughs> just the Jackie Chan and the Baron Bolo and the Imanari, I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different exercise when you add all that stuff onto it. Look at that. He, he was trying to invert over that other leg, too. Yeah. That's yeah. uh there's a uh, Felipe Costa does a sweep like that. But look, man, they're they're just doing the same stuff over and over again, just fighting for the same techniques. You know, oh, and this is where Craig has this great move from right there. I don't think he pulls it off here. But if he inverts, he'll move backwards and push his butt against your chest to release that bottom leg that he's got, you know? So he's got it kind of wrapped up with his arms and then he'll, he'll push his butt against your chest so that you fall backwards and so that he can get in that honey hole position. Man, McMillan and I were um, rolling somewhat recently, and he, uh, he discovered an interesting little calf crusher I've never thought about. Huh. This kind of came up, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is interesting. Uh, but it's just like one of those incidental sort of things. Maybe he had it planned and has been working on it for like – but it, it, it just seemed like kind of came up. And I was like, hey, man, I think that could submit me. But it's when someone has you in the honey hole. Oh, really? I showed it to John the other day, and he was freaking out about it. Like, he was, like, immediately, like, his face lit up. And I was like, I know, man, I felt the same. Like, as soon as it, I felt it, the pressure it created on the calf when I was rolling with Josh, I was like, wow, here's that Kimura trap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he's out. Man, these guys are just slipping out of everything. Well, and their guard retention is insane, <laughs> you know? See how Gordon keeps scooting like sideways to where they're yeah. in like, an L position almost. Yeah, and it, it's uh, I think it's on the it's basically the equivalent of what Gary Tonin does standing, mm -hmm. that Gordon Ryan does on the ground. So he's trying to push almost kind of side to side, and you know when Gary Tonin's standing up, you know how he he doesn't face people square. He kind of yeah, rolls in sideways and looks for that scissor. I think that's kind of what Gordon Ryan's doing, but on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> it's all that inside leg position. God, they just work so hard for that. <laughs> Yeah, I know, man. They need to just be like, uh, I know Donna has put out a video and it may go into more, but like uh, on the leg locks, but there's that one super famous video they have on YouTube that's like moving from De La Hiva to the inside leg position. But you know, they've got that idea from every situation. Like, here's how we move from here to leg lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there, well, outside guards to inside guards, basically. And I think it, in this level of competition, too, there's something, there's an advantage to that kind of single-mindedness because it takes out having to think too much. You know where you got to be, and you're just committing all out to get those positions. Look how low Gordon's getting. That's a good idea. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you who I was watching roll the other day that has some amazing um, back defense was Eddie Bravo. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah, I was watching um, back attacks too. I was watching uh, Andre uh, Galvo, uh, and you know he does that like uh, he wraps up that one leg from the back and sort of kicks over the other leg. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. I think you got to have incredibly strong upper body to do it. But. Man, Eddie was too, like, crossing his feet, but, like, his his knees were – he'd moved himself down, crossed his feet over the person's legs, but they couldn't ankle lock him. Yeah. And it was – you know, he has real flexible hips. It was, it was interesting to, how his legs looked. Yeah. But, uh, 
Ooh. I oh, know. Yeah, you know it's coming. <laughs> that monster's on your back, and he's going to squeeze your face off as soon as he gets a chance. Yeah. But he's using the, you know, he's using the body triangle and making sure that, you know, he's not on the lock side. He's got that, uh, that foot down playing with Jones's legs so that he doesn't get it. Yeah. See, now he's in a bit of a precarious position, but he rolls him back. Yeah. A lot of body triangle in these matches we've been watching. The last match, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I get, you know, with these Nogi guys, that's, you know, it's honestly probably a better technique. You just got to keep it from getting underneath. Craig uses that that hand behind the head defense, and uh, Gordon Gordon used more classical kind of two on one escape. There it is. Yeah, it's so good stopping uh, Gordon from flattening him out. Yeah, because he's rolled belly down a couple of times. Yeah. But he keeps going back to this. He'll put his left hand behind his head, and then he'll push over to the lock side, try to get that down. Because, you know, in this overtime, if the guy mounts you, uh, you've actually escaped the position. Mm -hmm. So he's almost inviting the mount. Right there. Yep. That's how he escaped. I mean, in real life, that's not much of an escape, but <laughs> in this, it is. This is where it gets exciting. Yeah. How old is Gordon here? 23 or something? 24? Yeah, man. He's still, yeah. I wish we were this cool when we were 24. I uh, know. I wish I could retire at 25, <laughs> whatever he is now. Uh, buy his parents' houses and cars and stuff. Oh, man, that is, that's it, dude. Yeah. Ooh. Look at that cross foot finish. Yes. Yeah. Man, look at Gordon's face. Yeah. I want to watch all that again. <laughs> It's nice. He gets up high. He just goes across. See, I like, I like when the he... Thumb yeah. work. Right that, there. He's... Yeah, that's all about thumb work, man. Yeah. Look at him keep twisting on the thumb to get the thumb up, and then the legs sort of move. I wonder... Um if that hurt Gordon's arm, or I wonder how much it hurt Gordon's arm. Oh, it, you know, it had to, it had to. <laughs> I mean, you know, it wasn't enough, but it had to. He was almost tapping. He's a big burly dude though, man. Having the back here, it's just, you know. It's gonna go back to the same technique. Like a replay. I like that he sort of pummeled for uh you know, the underhook from the back. So he'll switch his arm position based on where Craig Jones is. There he is with that again. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he'll go back to it every time. 
I like doing that with like when I get the two on one over, like when I clear an arm over to the side. I, like you know, we do that one escape to kind of go into the dars. Yeah. I haven't used that in a long time though, and I haven't ever really used it the way that Jones is using. It. Yeah, and he only. What's interesting about Jones is that uh, the first time I think it worked because that lockdown was on the same side that he's reaching back. Like on that side, that's that's mm -hmm. pretty good. Uh, but on the other side, when uh, Ryan switches his his triangle, it doesn't seem to be as an, as effective. I think that's something I'd have to you know try out in the gym to kind of see if that's true or not. Yeah. Man, uh, Craig Jones is doing so good about just keeping his hips level with the floor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A lot, that's a, that's something that's hard for people to understand about escaping the back in the beginning. Got yeah. it. Yeah. He just, he finally got that, that choke in. So. <laughs> crazy match yeah i remember <laughs> go ahead no it's interesting to see two guys with such similar styles kind of go at it and then it comes down to stuff that you know is not part of their regular game you know and escaping back position and so you know you sort of realize how incredibly well-rounded these guys are, even though their offense is pretty, you know, pretty straightforward, pretty linear. Yeah, it is. Um, I remarked on that just from my uh, competition experience. You Sometimes you slip into your patterns, and then most of the time your match ends up going it down – an unpredictable path in which you do a lot of things that you never did in the gym to prepare for that match. Yeah. 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 And it, it, it's, uh, the most success that I've had, I mean, you know, and I, I, I've never been, a, a tournament rat like these guys, but you know, when, when I was competing, the most success I had was when I was linear on, offense you know I had something in mind I knew what I was gonna do I saw it in my head and then I go and, and pull that off uh, but then you know I'm more sort of free-flowing on defense and looking for opportunities and things like that uh, and it's it's being able to it seems to me that it's being able to sort of change that mindset when you need to you know when you sort of realize okay you know, how long are you going to be persistent with this thing? Um, it's like if you had an hour, you'll probably get it, but you don't have an hour. <laughs> you got seven minutes or whatever it is. And yeah, so you're, you're persistent. Yeah, so you're persistent with it until you got to, you know, until you got to be creative or you're put in a bad position and got to look for a different opportunity. For sure. So, yeah, but, it, you know, even with this format, that's that's kind of what they do. You know, they'll they stick to the thing that they're trying to get through regulation. And then over time, you know, they're just uh, they're, they're working those positions and working their defense. It's all, you know, that it, it's there wasn't a lot of. There's not a lot of creativity in the stuff that they're doing, but there's a lot of subtle little nuanced movements in the things that they do, you know? So it's, uh, I don't know, that, that's kind of, to me, that's part of the evolution of jujitsu right now is that, uh, you know, and the reason so many people are successful early is because they can do those one or two things just really, really well. And if they're devastating like leg locks, you know, you can get a long way really fast just by concentrating on that one thing and making sure that that's pretty tight and, and you can defend uh, in the stuff that people are going to throw at you. 
But part of the reason these guys are so successful so early too is that they're all offense all the time. They don't, yeah. you know, they don't play defense. <laughs> that, <laughs> they don't that, wait. They don't counter punch. They go straight in. Well, that's one thing that I've heard Lobato attribute a lot of his success to over the years. He's like, it's just that submission-oriented, attacking, offensive mindset. Yeah, and the, the Danaher crew, for sure, that's, man, they're just, it's constant attack. They don't let up. Uh, and it, it, what was interesting about that, that match with Jones and, and Ryan is that Ryan was having to play some defense, and he's not used to that. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, worth remarking on for sure. Is that like when you do have people uh, that are going to be able to start putting Gordon Ryan in bad situations? That's going to be more interesting because I know he prepares for those in the gym. But how much is he really put in danger? I mean, he can start from bad positions, but he still knows he's in the bad spot. Like, yeah. it, which when you get put there and you weren't ready for it, I mean, who's ready to get swept to? A position like I mean yeah no I know usually yeah. not anticipating it to happen yeah well and it, it's it, you know it gets back to what Jack was talking about with with Hickson I mean you know some of that's just uh just composure <laughs> you know it's like all right that happened move on uh yeah. but it's like those those <sighs> those panicky things we were talking earlier about, you know, what if Eddie Cummings has you in this heel hook? And, you know, it's like I said, if I was there and I know what that guy can do, I, man, I don't know if I can train out of that panic. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it would produce, tear my knee up, man. <laughs> think about this. In some people, it would produce literal anxiety. Oh, for sure. Like overwhelming anxiety and panic being in that. Oh, place. yeah. No, it's like, get me out of this. This is not worth, but that's kind of, you know, that's the interesting thing about jujitsu is that it, it's um, the psychological control is the result of the physical control. And it's, <laughs> you know, um, I've been reading all this stuff about uh, uh, interrogation techniques as part of my research. And they talk so much about how environment can create situations for people where they will um, they will do things that they wouldn't normally do, or they'll you know they'll they'll give up information, or they'll lie to you, or they'll uh, you know they'll lose themselves, kind of in those moments, or the idea of themselves. But it's all this environmentally based stuff. So you put somebody in a room for a couple of years with a single light bulb and keep it at 50 degrees for long enough, you know, there's, they're going to, they're going to break down. Man, and that it, is, uh, listening, like to research all that Pueblo stuff that we just did that podcast on. Uh, yeah. and that, that's what Mitch talks about. Um, in the podcast he's done is the, the hell week. But th but those soldiers they were POWs for a year. Yeah. You know. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. And can you imagine the the anxiety and the pressure and what that does to yourself? I think you know one of the what's interesting about jujitsu and and maybe it's the reason that we talk about ego so much is that you know you become invested in your skills and in being safe and being able to protect yourself and you move along and particularly at higher ranks and things like that, you get this image of, all right, I should be able to do this. And what's interesting about that is that that can make you vulnerable. Somebody puts you in a position where it's outside of that norm or, you know, you're, you're feeling in danger um, that you're, you're not used to that. And it's almost like you're giving up your identity to tap. <laughs> or to give in and that can be used against you you know that people can control you that way uh so it, it's interesting i mean it, it, it's I, the psychological parts of jujitsu have always been sort of fascinating to me because you're getting somebody to give up and that's a mental thing right 
it's not necessarily a physical thing. If it was a physical thing, then, you know, particularly in sports jujitsu, sport jiu -jitsu, we just let people break each other's arms and stuff. But it, it's, you know, it's controlling somebody to the point where they say, all right, I got nowhere to go. You, you own me. <laughs> and man, that's, <laughs> that's a scary thing. That's an interesting thing. It is interesting. I, you remember a while back when Cora made that post on Facebook talking about like why guys think they're, you know, you know whatever, like yeah, yeah. all, all yeah. guys they can fight. You mean you provided some insight into that with a comment I thought was profound because man, there's a lot of psychology that goes into all of this, whether you're competing or it, it, it's before you ever even arrive to the gym or know anything about it, that you have all these preconceived notions that really you have to, you have to overwrite them if you want to be successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, if I remember correctly, the, the basic notion behind what we were talking about in that thing was that um, the male sort of ego, the male identity is so tied to being tough and looking tough that we spend a lot of time trying to do that, but we're really scared to death to test ourselves in that, right? So, you know, we act tough so that we don't have to fight more than we do because we want to fight, you know? And yeah, I think that's- A, a defense, yeah. an outward projection is a defense mechanism, really. Yeah, yeah. and. It, Jiu-jitsu is interesting because it, it forces us to sort of practice this stuff and confront that basic fear. And then, but also by confronting that basic fear, I think it can reduce our anxiety and our need to sort of, um, to look like we're tough all the time. So, you know, Ironically, I think jujitsu has made me a gentler and calmer person because I'm, you know, confronting those weaknesses, but also recognizing those strengths, uh, you know, every day. And it's probably what I miss the most about not being in the gym. It's like, I, you know, I, I just, I miss, the, I've gotten used to that pressure, that anxiety of being in a match as a kind of constant everyday thing. And you just get used to it, right? You just kind of live there. And I hadn't lived there for a month. So I guarantee you when everybody gets back on the mat, it's going to be anxious. <laughs> People are going to be going at it. It's going to be like, it'll be tense and they're going to, everybody's going to gas in the first minute. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's going to take us a while to sort of get back there to where we're, we're sort of living in that dynamic all the time, you know? So I take all this to mean you haven't been smashing your daughter. No, man, that would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then, okay you gotta train her and your wife up for a while and then <laughs> them both come on you at the same time <laughs> i hear you i know or the dog the dog's yeah, actually the, the dog worst involved, yeah, yeah when, the Cora, dog cheats. when Cora beats me up in the kitchen which is quite often <laughs> um the dog always is on my side he's like whoa what are you doing to my master <laughs> awesome yeah see my dog's not on my side she's my dog but she's like all right this is a chance to beat up on the old man let's do that man, your dog has such a pretty color what uh, is that what kind of dog is that she's a golden retriever yeah she's turning really red now yeah she, she was kind of lighter when she was younger but she's turning super red it's, yeah she's really pretty yeah i saw in that video you put in that group she beautiful dog yeah, yeah, and she's a lot of fun, and, you know, she's she's still only, like, five, she's between five and six months, and so she's still, like, she's a punk. She's just getting into everything and just, you know, just met with you constantly. It's a lot of fun, but she's also, you know, she's a lot of work right now.
Ours is just getting the youngest dog, Gracie. She's just getting on the other side of it. It's I so saw some of Cora's post. Yeah, she was when, proud of. When Cora yells at both of them, Hicks and Gracie. But it's like it's like. <laughs> oh, I love that. You get you got to send that to Hickson. You got to record that. <laughs> you have to, hey man, I I name my dogs after you. Listen to my wife <laughs> yell at them. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with uh, Daniel O'Brien about his uh, sort of yeah. his influences. That's going to be a real cool interview. Yeah, yeah, and he's got that heavy karate background, right? It's karate or taekwondo. I can't remember. I'm gonna have to do some research but he does I, I saw him doing a kata video the other day and i couldn't tell by the kata whether what style it was yeah i'm really interested in this path because it, it seems like it, it's it's typical for a lot of us and it's true of me you know you, you got i got to jujitsu later it wasn't you know i don't know many people where jujitsu is their first and primary art it's like there's so many people that come to it from some other place just because it's, it's not as common here in the United States. I mean, I'm sure in Brazil, it, yeah. it's, you know, it's the first martial art for, for most people. But like here, it's almost always second or third. What year, what year did you start training in Taekwondo? Oh, man, I was in uh, the first time was in high school. And then uh, and then. I, I did it more regularly in college. Uh, and then uh, I came back to it when my son got into it when he was like seven. Uh, so it, it was three different periods of, of Taekwondo. So. Yeah, yeah. And I know we've talked about your sort of like you've been you've had a relationship with martial arts at several points of your life and ultimately has this been the longest since you've been doing jiu-jitsu that you've consistently trained in art oh for sure oh absolutely no yeah. this, this how is how long has it been 11 years uh yeah i mean with me and you yeah <laughs> it's been 11 years i yeah. had a year before you and i started training where I was doing a little bit of cross training uh, with the MMA guys in my gym. So we had a few MMA guys when I was doing Taekwondo and uh, I would help some training with them and got some, not very many basics, but you know, just a few little things here and there. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, 11 years and you know, it'll be 12 in, in January. And I remember us, talking about this when it first started I was like you know I fell in love pretty quickly it was like all right I'll do whatever you say I'm committed to this we're gonna see it through to the end and uh you know I was hoping that uh we get I'd be somewhere close to a black belt uh by the time I was 50 and so I turned 50 in August I got four tips on the on the brown belt so here we are, man. Here we are. <laughs> Only thing stopping us now is the quarantine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I, I've been trying to um, to keep things going best I can. And so, like, analyzing these videos, you know, and I know they're not perfect for me. I know I don't know everything, but just looking for the things that I do know about and trying to find the subtleties in, you know, these really high level players roles, that's helpful to me. I mean, I think that's, that's taking a step and it's something that I can do when we're locked down, you know? Um, and so I'm, you know, I want to, I'm trying to keep going. I'm trying not to just sort of atrophy <laughs> with the jujitsu. Yeah, man. Well, I don't remember where I heard or read this, but I came across a quote somewhat recently, sort of, comparing fit physical and like the death of your mind and the death of your body being is sort of interrelated for sure one leading to the other like you could be sharpening your body but just never take anything new into your mind and it's going to kind of be a negative result and vice versa as well yeah and this is it like the the coronavirus stuff 
and the people sort of being at home all the time and changing their, their typical routine. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's a, it's a chance for people to sort of really discover that relationship. Cause you know, if I was, if I had to be here at home all the time and I'm not exercising daily through this, dude, I'd be going nuts. Oh yeah. I can't imagine. And it, because one would lead into the other. I would, I would just start giving up. I mean, it, it's hard enough to work in this environment. I mean, just not being around other people, I think is hard. It, it, it takes away like some of the spark, some of the stimulation that we have as human beings, some of our creativity just comes from being around other people's energy, you know, and we're, we're missing all that. And so the exercise to me and being out in the sun and stuff like that, it's not a perfect exchange. But man, it helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you um, you've been taking vitamin D? Are you noticing now that you're getting some more sunlight and it's getting nicer outside? Are you like, yeah, I don't, the levels I, good? Yeah, I don't need it as much for sure. Yeah, the the, the sunlight's going to produce more vitamin D in me than any of those supplements ever could. I mean, I could be taking massive amounts and still not get as much as I could from the sun. So, yeah, being in the sun is 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 huge and it's so you know that vitamin d is important for people's um sort of mental health and their their mental well-being and something that we take for granted you know it's another thing that i've been studying in in, in my research so my research is, is about this guy who's a uh, prisoner of war in, in vietnam for uh seven years and so i'm trying to think about what it was like to sort of be him and and the psychological and physical toll that that kind of thing takes and uh you know that he, his exercise i think was one of the things that kept him alive during his incarceration you know because he's in solitary confinement most of the time um so he was missing all that social interaction that people need um he finally got it, but the thing that, that keeps him going is exercising physically, but then also exercising his mind, you know, creating new things, pushing, you know, his mind into new areas. Um, I think for a lot of us that do jujitsu, you know, it's the, the nexus of that physical and mental stimulation. You know, it, it's kind of, it's the best of both worlds, at least for me, it is, because you, you have to be sort of creative and you, you have to think in new ways and you got to be physically fit and not to have that, not to have that stimulation means that I got to, you know, I got to find that in new ways. So breaking down video, you know, doing a Murph every other day or so, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that I, you know, 11 years straight doing this stuff, you know, you just crave it. You know, and I, I gotta have, I gotta have my supplements. I got it right. No, it's, man. Like, it's like that vitamin D supplement. My supplements trying to watch these films and trying to go for a run and, you know, doing that stuff. Have you been getting a, a lot of writing or research done during the downtime? Yeah. Um, so because of the, the administrative stuff that I've done, I'm out of practice. And so I've spent the time, uh, that we've been at home to get back in practice. Uh, and for me, that's, uh, I got to spend an hour to two hours a day just working on research and writing and nothing else during that time. And it's the first thing that I do in the morning. I'd done that for 20 years uh, before I got into administration. And then administration sort of, <clears throat> I couldn't do that. It was, it, it just wasn't working anymore. I did it through about half of my administrative career, uh, but it got to be such a grind <laughs> that I couldn't do all of it. So now that administrative stuff's over, I'm getting back into that routine. And so, yeah, it, it's, I'm taking steps, you know, I'm not at the level that I used to be, but I'll get there, you know, and it, it's just, it's practice, it's routine. It's like going, you know, it's like going to the gym on a regular basis. I, I, I can't, 
it's been 11 years. I mean, with the exception of an injury here, there, and, you know, vacation. You still have never been out more than a week or two. I don't think I've been without jujitsu for a week in 11 years. Yeah. You know? And so <laughs> this is, you know, it's really different to have to get back into a different routine. I'm sure it's the same for you. I mean, you guys, your whole lives are revolve around this stuff. So it's got to be super strange for you. It is. I'm still at the gym every day. Um, we've been getting tons of stuff done at the gym, settled in more. Tim's yeah. been there working a lot. Um, I'm exercising every day. I mean, it's, I'm getting, man, I like it because I'm getting tons, like what you're remarking on, like I'm getting tons of stuff done without feeling overwhelmed or strapped for time. Like I've got a couple of three hours in the morning where I'm just doing my stuff for classes and listening to books and yeah. growing, growing my mind. And then I've got time where I'm just doing martial arts and jujitsu and time where I'm just hanging out with my dog who loves that I'm home. You know, he's like, yeah. you haven't left. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's been the, the good part of all this for me is that, I think I've reconnected with my family in a way that I, cause we're all working together, you know, we're all sitting here and you know, you've got this beautiful advantage of being able to, I mean, I, I know it's not always great, but you know, you work with your wife and, and uh, so. Well, I tell you, yeah. I took it for granted. Like, man, when I started teaching, I didn't realize until like that moment, like day three is sitting in my office. I was like, I'm never going to see Cora again during this time. <laughs> like, I, like, it was a sad moment for me because I realized we're right then. Yeah. How much I had taken that time during the day, that six, seven hours that I wasn't going to have anymore for granted. Yeah. No, and I, I, I so I really like that part of it. Uh, I think uh, the, the other part that I think has been huge for me is that it's gotten rid of my commute. And so, you know, I'm two hours a day on the road every day for the last, wow, since graduate school, man. It's been 25, 27 when I, years. When I first met you and the Black, I was like, how do those guys do it? Now I have a 30-minute commute one way. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, you know, it's kind of good. You, know, you listen to your books and, yeah. you know, there, there's time to reflect. And it can be good. You can make it into a positive. But it's also, I added it up, and since I've been doing it, it's something like two, two and a half years on the road, in the car. Yeah, it's insane, man. <laughs> and I think it's two and a half years of work days, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like Monday through Friday. But still, and, man, that's a lot of time. It's a ton of time, uh, you know, and it's like, all right, if I had, if somebody had told me at the beginning of it, all right, you're going to spend two years of nine to five days in the car out of these 20, 25 years, would you do it? And in that perspective, it's like, hell no, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but that's not how it works, right? It's these increments, you know, it's, it, it's life. It's part of what we have to do. Um, and, you know, you use the time as best you can. So and as an administrator, I bet you were really logging the hours too. Like when you were Dean, like your commute plus longer hours, more days. Yeah. 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 It, yeah. There were a lot of like 16, 18 hour day kinds of things. Um, they weren't, all the time, but at certain times they yeah. were. And that's just a drag, man. Uh, so I, I much prefer what I'm doing now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even with even when I have the commute and, and schools in and everything, I still much prefer what I'm doing now. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's easier to think. It's, it's better for me. You know, it's just good. Well, man, I think like, 
and I, I remarked on this to you before, but like when you told me you're going to teach some more, I was like, that you, that's where you're going to make a, for me, I would say, and maybe not, maybe you made a bigger difference as an administrator in, in, in the overall, like in a bigger picture sense. But like for, yeah. for my experience, it's like, oh, well, that guy made a difference for me as a student, big time. Uh, he's going to yeah. do that for more people. Maybe yeah. That's more tangible. Yeah, my, my influence as an administrator is diffuse. And it's not quite as, I mean, it's important, but it's not like uh, teaching somebody and learning from somebody is a much more intense relationship and you can you know i can change somebody's life and they can change mine in that relationship in an administrative relationship it's pretty rare i mean we got all these rules and things like that and you're just you know you're managing things and you're um you know people rely on you for their livelihood to some degree. And so you're making decisions about budgets and, and things like that. But all of that's pretty, you know, it's pretty rote. There's not a, you know, sometimes you can come up with a creative solution that can really help somebody, but it's pretty rare. But like in teaching and learning and you're, man, that's, it's like, it can be at its best. It can be life changing every day uh, for both parties. And so, you know, I really miss that. I think it's, you know, there's a, there's a certain intensity to that connection with people that I'd really missed. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, I feel like, I think you're right. I mean, I think I make more of a difference in people's lives this way than well, I was. Here's something else to think about too. Like, based off the number of people I know that know you that is like shoot many of them 10 of them probably been on this podcast like uh professors that were in the college of arts and humanities that you got to work with you definitely made a similar type of impression on those people mm. as a leader you know because they all remark on it about what it was like to interact like like Aaron Claire like all of these people I hear remark on it but Warnick and, and, and so on it got to work with you sort of professionally uh, whether it was on committees or what have you but that is a place that like in the individual lives of those professors I've, I've heard so many of them remark on it that you probably well it's it it's nice of them I don't <laughs> you know that they, they uh those are also the people you mentioned you know that they're uh, they're remarkable people and, you know, I, I like working with them and, you know, honestly, that's where, like, I think most stuff in life is you find some people that you like to work with and you find this way where you can be creative together and hopefully be creative together in ways that you couldn't as an individual and that's what's really special and so you know i think they may appreciate me in that stuff but i also appreciate them that was a two-way street i didn't you know i didn't do anything necessarily different or special to to create that but it, it i also think it's not that much different than like you know our relationship you know i've gotten to be your teacher you've gotten to be my teacher and I think what we found is over time, we're both benefiting from whatever role we're playing in that, you know, and we're able to be sort of creative together. We're able to think about things together that we couldn't, you know, separately or individually. And, you know, that's the, uh, that's the, the sort of, that's the good stuff, you know, <laughs> that's the stuff that, that you seek out. Cause the rest of it is just management, man. It's just getting by day to day. And, and so, you know, that the spark of life is all of that, you know, it's that creativity It's doing something interesting and meaningful and something that, you know, um, moves people. Uh, that's, you know, that's all I wanted from any of this kind of stuff. And so and there's a bunch of different ways to do it. 
I think teaching is a better way to do it than what I was doing before. Man, I just, I've learned so much teaching martial arts and uh, just in my short amount of time teaching history. Like it's, it's really amazing how much I've learned in two years. Oh yeah. Now you learn more teaching than you do anything else. I mean, it, you know, it's, I still don't, I wish I could figure out how to get my students to teach and to teach each other. Uh, the trouble is not everybody takes to it that well. And so I think that's why we sort of devolve into the traditional ways of, of teaching. But to my mind, that's, you know, that's how you really absorb something. So when you got to teach somebody else and people who are natural teachers, I think are natural learners too. I see my daughter all the time. She's just, you know, she loves teaching people stuff and, and she, you know, she's always teaching her classmates when they're not keeping up and, and things like that. And so, you know, but she's also, she's just really smart and, and, and is really good at it and was natural at it. And to me, that's like, you know, I grew up in an academic family. Teaching and learning is, is not a, uh, it's, it's a way of life. I mean, it, it's a, it's not a religion, but it's pretty damn close. I mean, if you think that your purpose in life is to learn as much as you can about your existence as a human being, then that's, you know, that's a life that's, <laughs> to me, that's my purpose. That's, that's what's meaningful to me. That's what I want to try to get out of you know, my time spinning around on this planet <laughs> is learn as much as I can, find out as much as I can and try to, you know, figure out what's, what's true and what's not true and then help other people with that same journey. And, you know, if I can be part of perpetuating that for us as a species, I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting somewhere. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's all I want to do. <laughs> it's a, it's all I want to do and I'm not a, you know you can't be intense about it all the time uh but uh you know that that's I'm I'm hoping that's kind of uh where I'm going what I'm doing and that's where my priorities are uh any ideas on when you might um or goals or when you might wrap up your next book it's so I've got a framework that's in the can, but I want to do something, you know, you never want to do what you did before you want to do something new, something different. And so I want to do something that's a little more, I'm, I'm trying to go down some avenues that aren't typical for historians to go down. Uh, Cause you know, you, you do this career and you, you choose this path and, and, you get all educated and, and you're doing things the way that, that other people have taught you and it's great and you're mastering your craft, but I also need to, to push beyond that. And uh, so that's why I'm doing all this stuff with, you know, uh, psychology and with, uh, you know, medicine and the environment and uh, that kind of stuff, because that's not, that hasn't been part of my learning process before, you know, it, it's all been politics and, um, you know, uh, uh, warfare strategy and, and, um, you know, uh, things like, um, you know, the, the McCarthyism and, and cultural kinds of things, stuff like that. So I've wanted to, you know, I've wanted to push that further. And so that right now, even though I've got this backbone on this book, I want to push into those areas to kind of push myself and I think create a better product for people in the end and, and go some places that they think are, are, are going to be interesting. And so, you know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, a lot of the things about being a prisoner of war is that you're going to get interrogated. And so I'm, I'm studying interrogation techniques from, the U.S. side and from uh, the Soviet and communist world side and where their influences come from and 
the assumptions behind uh, what they're doing. I mean, if you think about it, in some ways, the Cold War is about, uh, you know, it's about getting other people to buy into your way of life and into your socioeconomic systems and into your ideology. And so part of the assumption with that is that you can change people, that people will, can be taught to realize that what you're selling them is, is true. And I think what we see over and over again is the persistence of um, people's original beliefs. They don't change their minds very easily. And so what does that mean in this context, right? And, you know, the, the Cold War is a long war because it's just hard to change people's belief systems. It's just really difficult. You can change their behavior, but their beliefs are a whole different thing. And so I, like our beliefs malleable, basically. Yeah. And the whole assumption of the Cold War is that our, our beliefs are malleable, malleable. And I'm questioning that. I'm not sure it's true. And I think it helps explain why it, it took so long. And, you know, and people's commitment, too, isn't necessarily to, you know, liberal capitalist democracy or to communism in some kind of strictly defined way. It's those are little pieces of people's identities that kind of come in and out and can change over time. But there's also something about adverse circumstances and adverse environment that makes you more strongly believe or think that you believe in one thing over the other because it's, it's like a defense mechanism. And so, you know, if you, I just thought of this, maybe there's something analogous in jujitsu too, right? So you got something that works and under stress, that's what you go to. And you believe even stronger in that, even when it's not working right? Because that's what the stress is producing. So I think you get a similar kind of environment when you're, you know, if you're in warfare or you're in a prisoner of war situation, something like that, you've got this restricted environment. There's a lot of stress on you. So what happens? What do you actually believe in? Is it the same thing that you believed in before? Is it essential elements of that? Do you shed parts of that? You know, what happens? Um, so that's kind of, you know, it, it connects the existential with the national identity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of where, you know, that's what I'm searching for. That's what I want to add to the book before I try to put it out. So I'm thinking another year or two. That's a very long winded answer to your question. <laughs> so this, is, this podcast has turned out like some people are going to be hopping on here for some jujitsu matches. It's going to be like when Fear Haas comes on Joe Rogan, they end up getting like, natural philosophy is a is a historical inquiry <laughs> well that's the way it goes man i mean it, you know the real the joy of jujitsu is that it's not just jujitsu <laughs> you know it is. well was it you that kind of told me about chaos theory a long time ago yeah we talked about chaos and complexity theory sure yeah i mean it's kind of like pull just reining it all in from as many different areas as you can I, I, that's something that I, like, my students remark on this, and I remember too, this, but like how gen ed is kind of set up where I'm, I'm lecturing about the Minoans, but the art history prof, uh, pro, teacher is showing their artwork. Yeah. And meanwhile, they're over here reading about the Mycenaean period and with it, how it just kind of all dovetails together. And Man, I've had so many students remark on that to me and, and how that is beneficial to their learning, but it's, it's cross-discipline. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, um, I think the real value of human beings as thinkers is, is tied in to that. I mean, what we do best and what we do better in, in some ways than computers is pattern recognition. It's, it's making sense out of chaos. I mean, and we created computers as a, as a tool to do that, you know, um, and we create artificial intelligence to, to try to do that, but they don't do it nearly as well as the human brain does. I mean, we just, we see patterns, we see things that, you know, sometimes it's like when people are writing music, 
and they get this inspiration. They write, you know, this unbelievable song in about five minutes and it stays with people forever. It's just because, you know, that's not a result of somebody being, you know, all of a sudden struck out of the blue. It's because they worked a long time and then suddenly all of these things come together and they just see something, you know, they see a glimpse of something and they just go with it. And, you know, I love that. And that there's, I think that I, I had that experience in writing. I've got that experience in jujitsu. I've got that experience in teaching, you know, uh, sometimes in administration, not quite as much, but sometimes. Well, just in leading, you know, like in, in leadership, I think that's something it's like whatever sort of leadership role you're in, you, you end up being approached with some very interesting problems to solve that yeah. there's really nothing must be in it must be in a situation where you can kind of pull like okay yeah this is how i'm gonna deal with this this is how this is dealt with yeah yeah it's a. Uh, I don't know you can think of this maybe maybe pushes it too far but you know a big part of life is just getting up off the mat and moving forward you know get up off the concrete and brush off your psyche is one of my son's favorite rapper says <laughs> uh it, it's that's kind of what we do and and like when you're in a when you're in a leadership position or you, you own a gym or something like that you know you can you can wallow in the anxiety you can uh uh you could be overcome by the circumstances or you can lean into it, make the best of it as you can, take it as a learning experience, and then, you know, improve what you do when you get back. And, you know, man, if, if, if we could all keep doing that, and it, it's, and I don't mean being like too Pollyannish about it and, and thinking that everything's roses, because it's not. There's a lot of things that, that suck about the world. But I think, your persistence and your leadership and the, and the quality of human being you are is, uh, amounts to you, you know, just getting over stuff, just persevering, just moving on and finding the good things in life and, and continuing to be uh, creative and to build good relationships and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's uh, for all the crappy parts of this, you know, there, there's a bunch of this is the, a bunch of silver linings, man. This is the silver lining is like, man, I've like you, you were talking about improving with your family and just like the dynamic there. And same, like there's so much positive to take away from this. And like, I really haven't even had any negative remarks other than the fact like state shut down my business, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, they did, but they shut down a lot of people's businesses. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's, you know, and you're also, <laughs> You're also saving lives, <laughs> it, potentially. I mean, I, I know it's abstract and I know it's theoretical, but. Well, man, like I've thought about you several times because like you were in the hospital a year ago. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying like you're, you're at a risk, but um, it's like, has your immune system rebounded from that? Does that yeah. put you at more of a risk? Like I've thought about you several times just in that line of thinking. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, again, I think I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm not really worried about me uh, as much as I am, like you know, my parents or somebody like that. But, uh, but I have, you know, I have thought about it. It, it. It's something that it's like, all right, you know, how far have you recovered? I mean, that that wasn't that that long ago. Um, but it's also, you know, that I don't want to. I think the minute our society stops taking people's lives seriously, um, and again, it, it's, you know, you can say this about anything and you, you can make, there's all kinds of relative stuff. And we get used to things like the flu killing a bunch of people every year. And, you know, this is gonna be devastating, but it's, it's probably not gonna be as, as big as like what the flu's done in the last several years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is what's on your mind and, you can do something about it 
And so, you know, I think that's worth at least feeling pretty good about. Um, and we, we get into these sort of jaded modes. I mean, it's like, uh, we do the same thing with taxes, <laughs> right? So nobody likes taxes, but you know, your tax dollar did build that street out in front of your house, you know, and th there's a good that comes from that. It allows you to get to work. It allows Amazon to ship you crap, <laughs> you know, your Amazon man. <laughs> right. And so, you know, when you forget that stuff or you get too sort of bogged down in that, um, I think you kind of lose perspective. And so, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take all this stuff with, uh, keep some perspective on it. You know, it's not all bad. Um, it's not all good for sure. But, uh, you know, th there's some, there's some good stuff from it and we're all, we're all trying to do the right thing. I think uh, yeah. at least most of us are. So Man, I've, <laughs> you know, we're doing, everybody I know is essentially doing everything they could do and some yeah. people more than others, but uh, you know, I appreciate well, I don't know anybody that I would just like deem that like, man, you're not doing your part, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and doing your parts a balance too, man. And it's not the same for everybody. It's, it's like, you know, for some people, the economy, the economic fallout from this stuff is honestly as vital to them as the uh, health situation. Yeah. So for those folks, they really got to balance this stuff, man. If you're if you're living week to week off your paycheck, and the place where you work gets shut down because of this, dude, you got to help those people. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you got to. For people like me, who's, you know, the consequences of this just mean that I have to work from home. God, it's you know. It's not big. People don't need to worry about me. <laughs> man, 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 that is probably why I've kept a positive attitude about it for the most part. It's because I'm still filming lectures every day, which I would much rather be doing, actually. I mean, I like, I like lecturing, but the whole teaching online, I got no problem with it. Yeah, there's some good parts of it, right? I mean, and it can be more flexible for your students. I still miss them. I still want to be there, but it, it does make me think, all right, is there a better balance than what I've been doing? Is it like an all or nothing proposition? Yeah. Or is there something that I can mix together that would get the best of both worlds? And so maybe moving forward, that's what I'm going to look to do. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be different, man. I'm excited to see what's around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Things are good. And we'll get back to normal soon. We'll yeah. get back in the gym. <laughs> yeah. Well, man, I really appreciate you. Um, taking the time to podcast we'll have to uh we'll have to find some more matches to break down and yeah. um, thurman storian and i uh are amidst a, po a series of podcasts on 1968 so we might have uh, to we might have to lean on you for an episode or something about maybe way i don't know sure yeah yeah uh, no, those I, you're an expert on <laughs> well yeah experts relative man <laughs> yeah. i know a little bit i know a few things about a few things that's about it <laughs> well man thanks again for taking the time woods uh stay safe yeah. and uh yeah. we'll see you soon man okay man have a great day all right see you bro later